excited about today. You see, we have some very special guests to speak with us today. We have Dr. Lena Martin. Dr. Martin is a proud alumna of the Pepperdine Graduate School of Education and Psychology. You see, she received an EDD in organizational leadership, but that's not all. She is a glutton for punishment. And she is back with us currently in the PhD program, Global Leadership and Change. She's a woman interested in the future, interested in intellectual pursuits. Additionally, she teaches blockchain applications and analytics at the Pepperdine Grazia Dio Business School and she is the founder and director of the Blockchain at Pepperdine program. It provides blockchain conferences, curriculum, certificates, and collaborations. Now, Dr. Lena, Dr. Lena Martin is of Norwegian American descent. That's her heritage. She is ever the academic. And her research and work focuses on Nordic leadership models of social and economic growth and sustainability. Specifically, the convergence of emerging technologies, corporate social responsibility, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am so proud of this GSEP alum. Dr. Martin is also an investor of tech startups, an advisor and director of several boards, and she's a published author and international speaker. Come on, Dr. Lena Martin. Let's give her a GSEP and lifelong learning warm welcome let's applaud her come on ladies let's she's pretty spectacular i would think huh well she's not alone today she bought some more bright and shining light with her with her is our dear friend and colleague cynthia ware the woman with the warmest smile in all of pepperdine she is the director of the Pepperdine Fund, the department that receives and oversees donations and support, yes, support for the mission and operations of the university. Ms. Ware holds a Master of Science in Emerging Technologies. Additionally, she has a cryptocurrencies and disruption certification from the London School of Economics and Political Science. This lady is busy. A true practitioner of today's rapidly developing cryptocurrency innovation, Ms. Ware is a holder of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and several other cryptocurrencies, many of them I'm sure I can't even pronounce. It's so very new. She has studied blockchain applications for the last five years. Now, some of us know we're just now hearing of Bitcom. It's a new language for us and she has been studying it for the last five years, investigating how new monetary systems hold the capacity to transform government and industry. We are in for a scholarly and a pragmatic lesson today. Please, all together, let's give both Dr. Martin and Ms. Weir a warm, enthusiastic, lifelong learning women's forum, round of applause. 
Welcome, ladies. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Martin. Miss Ware, Miss Ware, <laughs> Cynthia. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Dean Williams. We are so happy to be with you ladies today. And we are grateful to Kathy Donhockel for hosting this event. Kathy, when you, when you get better, we're all coming to your house just like we used to. So you can count on us being back on the ground, hopefully in the fall. Um, I did wanna make a few opening remarks to set the stage and then I'm gonna turn it right over to Dr. Martin to talk about the basics of blockchain. Um, but a couple of disclaimers to get us started. The first is, as has been noted, we hold crypto. We like to say that up front. So there's a predisposed bias right there. The second thing is nothing we say today is financial advice of any kind. So this is about educating you, nothing more. And the last thing I wanna say um, about our session today is there's no possible way that we could answer all of your questions. It's just not, it's not conceivable. However, that's not our goal. Our goal is to pique your curiosity, to um, cause an inspiration in you to want to go further on your own, to explore this topic and really educate yourself. And the thing about this topic is it's both elegantly simple and yet quite profound and complex, especially as it applies to the ramifications of what these technological protocols can actually do, which is still being uncovered and developed. In fact, many people take months and months to really understand what does all this mean. And uh, just so you know, crypto has its own whole culture. It's got a vernacular, it's got memes, it's got urban legends. Um, it, they call people that are not in crypto normies. They call people that are in crypto hodlers. And so you're gonna hear a lot of words today. You might not know what they mean because they're part of that other culture. And the, the talk that we're going to have may cause you to do what crypto people call falling down the rabbit hole where each question that you have actually has an answer that you hadn't thought of and leads to another question, which leads to another answer. And many people have somewhat of a light bulb moment. Even if they already own some crypto, they have kind of a moment where it dawns on them, oh, this is bigger and more profound than I thought upon first blush. And um, I, I wanna set the stage by saying this could help you. Get out a phone or a pen and a paper and write down the words that you don't know. As, as Dr. Martin says things and you're thinking, what does that mean? Just jot it down. Everything is available on the internet. You, you can leave this meeting and go right to the web and say, show me a diagram of what blockchain does. And just like Dr. Martin says, it's gonna to come to life for you. Um, the other thing I wanna say is that as women, and certainly as um, people of color and other disenfranchised populations, there's a level playing field. And ladies, we can step right into position these technologies are gender agnostic. And unlike the financial system that's been in place for hundreds of years, back to the Medici's, this is not going to be an old boys club unless we let it. And so the idea of stepping forward and stepping up and at least investing in trying to educate yourself will benefit you greatly. Sometimes people ask me, is it too late? We are at the very beginning. This is seminal technology. We don't even know where all it's going to go. It's embryonic. You're poised perfectly to educate yourself and be inquisitive. And, and don't let things like um, coding languages or transactions per second or any of the tech, technological part, don't let that bother you. Get right in and try to expand your mind by letting go of what you think you know 
like our current monetary system is very secure and learning what you don't know. And um, again, I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Martin. There's really nobody that's an expert in this yet. And that's to your advantage. There are people with a lot of knowledge, but the way this technology has the ability to cross pollinate many fields of industry, many verticals, uh, it's a cross disciplinary technology. You, to, to be a true expert, you'd have to know computer science and mathematical algorithms. You'd have to know all about finance systems and theory and Austrian economics and liquidity and supply derivatives and securities and commodities. And it's just not possible. You'd have to know how software protocols work on the internet. You'd have to know game theory and logic, like what's a 51% attack and what's incentivized consensus. You'd have to know about government laws, privacy, identity, personal sovereignty. It's a big topic but it's very simple to understand. Just take a step-by-step -step approach. And Dr. Martin, with that, I will turn it over to you and you can, you can, we can all leave here knowing what is blockchain. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Dean Williams. Thank you for having us here today. Cynthia and I are very excited. We've known each other for quite a few years and have been in love with blockchain and crypto together and just always thrilled to share this knowledge with others and empower others. And uh, it's funny because we wrote our intro separately and we are so in tune because it is basically exactly what I wanted to share with all of you. So I'll do my own disclaimer of, again, this is not financial, legal or investment advice. We just want you, as Cynthia was saying, to find your rabbit hole. So we all talk in the crypto world of how did you find or come to find out about blockchain or crypto. My rabbit hole happened quite a few years ago when I was, my consulting company was advising one of the first public blockchain companies in the space. And I started to realize, and this is also in tune with what Cynthia was saying, the core values of blockchain are what we need to understand. And what I started seeing, because the other hat that I wear is women in leadership, I'm very involved in, in that initiative, is truth and freedom. Truth and freedom or autonomy and accountability is really what blockchain and crypto offers. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, again, we will talk to you later today about next steps, what to do if you want to be invested directly with crypto and what to do if you don't wanna handle and you're not computer savvy, but you can still get involved. So we'll talk about that as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about what blockchain at Pepperdine and what the two of us can offer you. And we're really excited to work with all of you. So yes, you'll get our contact information. We're looking forward to that. So again, there's a lot of information to cover today. We just want to inspire you, pique your curiosity. But again, as Cynthia was saying, it's about resources and opportunities at the end of the day. This is what it offers. It levels the economic playing field across the world for individuals worldwide. So think about it this way and I'm sure you all know about it. Data, this is not my quote, but whoever owns the future, they own the data, or whoever owns data owns the future. They coincide. All, think about all the data and the information that we put out on the internet, that we share about ourselves, that it's not secure. Blockchain offers that security. Blockchain also offers a way for us to get paid for our data, to earn from our data, to not give our data away for free. Because what blockchain does is it puts control and power back into the hands of individuals. That's why it makes for more social and economic inclusion for individuals and for the future of the world. So that's an important thing to understand before we get into sort of the, uh, the definitions and the history of blockchain. Whenever you get sort of lost, come back to what does blockchain actually do? What are its core values? And then you can, that's sort of our North Stars for today. And again, you're not late to the party. You are just right on time. So we're really excited to share this information with you. I'm sure you've been hearing in the news lately that more institutional capital is piling in. And I know 
folks that I've spoken to years ago about blockchain and crypto, and I'm sure Cynthia is experiencing this as well, it was it was too much information and it didn't make sense or there were skeptics or there you know all this and then now they're calling going wait what was that about again because you're seeing it in the news so that's building more mass adoption we're not there yet still early days but it's building more curiosity and it's building more trust because when you see michael saylor of microstrategy putting a lot of money and he's a champion in the space i'm a huge fan but also Elon Musk and Tesla putting in $1.5 billion. And that's when I started getting all the calls of what is crypto and can you tell me about it again? So it's a really exciting time. It's an exciting space. There's a shift. We're leaving the information age and going more into, and we have yet to land on a term, uh, but age of autonomy is floating around, the value age. It's how do we make value out of that information that the internet has created for us. So think about it this way, the same way that the internet redefined how we communicate and share information, blockchain is actually redefining how we make transactions. Now that's important, transactions. That can have to do, and you might've heard the term digital asset. A digital asset can be currency, can be resources, can be assets, can be access rights, can be voting rights, can be collectibles and art. We'll talk about that. Some of you might have heard about the Christie's auction and how $69 million went towards a NFT. We'll talk about that. But digital assets can also be records, uh, utility. Um, so we'll share this at the end, some books that we really recommend, but one that is very, very popular in our world is by Don and Alex Tapscott, a father and son duo, but they wrote Blockchain Revolution. And they have said that everything of value to humankind will live on the blockchain. So think about it this way soon, it won't be, oh, is that on the internet? Or, oh, is that on the database? It will be, is that on chain? Or is that on the decentralized web? We'll talk about what decentralized means as well. But just a few more highlights. As one congressman stated, blockchain enables more efficiency, effectiveness, and accountability. And that's, that's what we need to remember. So how does it do this? Its ability to streamline processes in business, it's going to secure our data, and it will empower individuals. And that saves time, that saves money, and it can even save lives. We'll, we'll try and hit on a few healthcare examples as well. So blockchain was first introduced in 2008 via a white paper. It was a white paper on Bitcoin. And it's important to understand that while Bitcoin was the first use case, blockchain is the underlying technology. So blockchain had to be created first. And who created it? It's actually a bit of a mystery. It's an unknown person, or it could be a group of people, could be a woman known as Satoshi Nakamoto. What happened in 2009 then after this white paper came out Bitcoin was launched and it was the first major digital currency. What made it unique what it is, it was the first to solve the issue of double spending. And we'll go into a little more details of what Bitcoin is and why it's so successful. There's many other cryptocurrencies, but there's only ever going to be 21 million. And this is important as we know with our fiat no longer being backed by gold, it it's, 21 million, so it's scarce and it's based on supply and demand, and it is not deflationary. It will move with the times. That's also why it's being referred to as digital gold, because technically, while maybe its original intent was money, currency, a security, it's labeled in the in you know regulations as a commodity. So think of it more like gold, but it's digital gold. So many people, as Cynthia was saying, known as hodlers, uh, which is really those who hold it because they're treating it as a store of value. So we'll talk a little bit more later about maybe you'd be interested in just investing in a company that deals with blockchain solutions or cryptocurrencies, or maybe you wanna get involved yourself directly, but we can talk about options of buying, selling, holding, all of that. But what's really unique about Bitcoin is that Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator, disappeared a year after that in 2010. 
So there's a few theories about what happened, but and even a theory that actually the government invented Bitcoin, which is a really fascinating one. But what they didn't maybe anticipate was all the other use cases that have come about because of the underlying software of blockchain technology. So moving on from Bitcoin, and again, there's many other currencies out there. You have to do your research if you get involved. Obviously, Bitcoin's a major one. Ether or Ether on the Ethereum blockchain is a major one. And actually, I will point out here, there are many different blockchains. Some, like the Bitcoin blockchain, just is for a Bitcoin currency. The Ethereum blockchain is more of a functional blockchain that is used for within businesses, more enterprise oriented. We'll talk about that, but there's different types of blockchains, but it's hitting every single industry, finance, government, law, transportation, retail, energy, agriculture, entertainment, sports, education, philanthropy, healthcare, construction, real estate. So I actually, if, if any of you in your industries or interests are curious about what it's doing, plug that into the, and if we have time later, plug that into the chat and, and we can play a little game of what, how you would benefit in your industry or benefit personally. That being said, blockchain, let's go back to the definition. It's a protocol that was created through the combined use of three older existing technologies. So we've got accounting ledger, those who are accountants can understand this, that's been around for thousands of years. Cryptography, this has to do with coding of messages that has also been around for thousands of years. Um, and then business computer network technology. So again, we'll talk a little bit about the peer-to-peer -peer networking architectures, but those are the main three sort of older existing technologies, but it's how it merged together that made this so exciting and so innovative. But as Cynthia was also saying, it involves software engineering, distributed computing, cryptographic uh, science and economic game theory. But here's what's important to remember. Even if your backgrounds are none of that, they're not mine either. <laughs> so everyone can play a role and get involved in this. There's a role for everyone. It's almost like saying, first of all, defining blockchain is like defining the internet. It's hard to do, or it just depends on is it e-commerce? Are you a developer? It depends from where you're coming from. That's one thing. But the other important thing to remember is people need to know how to be able to communicate about blockchain or do marketing or there's a role for everyone, I promise you. So while I do a lot of solution designs with enterprises and I walk through sort of a blockchain project life cycle, I also take my students through this um, sort of and, and pick a real world problem to solve and a thing to remember is blockchain is just one tool in your toolbox. It's not gonna always be the greatest tool or it might be for that particular problem, but what it does work for, it works for great. Um, it also might interact with other traditional uh, technologies like traditional databases and things. So it, it's a, and it might merge with AI, IoT and other emerging technologies. So it's important to remember, think of it like a tool, sometimes what the most difficult thing is figuring out a business process. Sometimes the technology can be the easiest thing. So, and, you, and you've got your tech teams and your experts, but it's figuring out the business process that is key. And then we, we talk more about it. So what is blockchain? Blockchain is a global, digital, peer-to-peer, -peer, decentralized and distributed database. Um, think of it like Google Docs. Think of it like we can determine who has the right to write to it, who has the right to read it, and all of that is being tracked, timestamped, layered, all the changes are layered on top of each other. So think of it like blockchain is named blockchain because it's a chain of blocks which contain information. So each transaction or piece of information that goes into that block, it's, it's logged that activity is logged. So each block of information is then linked to the next log of information using cryptography, so it secures it, and it's linked in chronological order to form that chain, hence blockchain. So the data that's stored inside the block will depend on the type of blockchain and, and so forth, like uh, a Bitcoin block will contain information about Bitcoins. But once a record has been added to the chain, it's difficult to change. You can't go back because the whole chain would fail. It's just not part of its you know, makeup. But blockchain has no central point. So because, think of it this way, because that shared database 
So basically, think about there's no central point. We think about, oh, our information's in the cloud. It's not. It's actually in a data farm or you know, somewhere. And that's a centralized location. Think about if someone or a company got hacked, they are hacking into that main point. There's a central point of failure. So you are vulnerable. Now your information is securely stored. Let's think of it as like on the back end of computers, but securely stored on many computers around the world. And everyone holds the same copy of information on the back end. So that if a new information comes in, if somebody's trying to hack in, it gets checked continuously against all the other copies and it gets booted out. So because of that, and I, I, won't, I don't want to blow your minds right now, and I'm sure some of you know, but blockchain actually doesn't require the internet. So that's kind of an exciting opportunity part for people around the world who don't have access. But that being said, that's why it's called peer to peer, because all these computers are linked together in this web. And there's no centralized location. That's why we call it decentralized. That's why we call it distributed. But the unique part about this, what does this allow? It eliminates the need for third parties or intermediaries or the middleman, as we call them. And those are companies like banks or companies that uh, <laughs> think of it like those that take extra fees and extra time away from us. And it allows that peer to peer transaction. The technology is providing the trust. OK, and so it's not disrupting jobs. I mean, AI and automation will already do that for us, but it is allowing our jobs more efficiency, effectiveness, and accountability. So it can actually free up our time. So don't think about, you might hear also some things of, oh, it's going to um, take jobs away or disrupt. It can only improve to a certain extent. Obviously, I'm biased and, and I see that, but that's why it's important to do your own research, especially if you start hearing different myths and things. Um, but also just uh, to, to clarify too, blockchain is also used to transfer and permanently record any change of asset between two or more parties. So that's also why we get into um, assets being defined again as ownership, money, cryptocurrency, estates, records of any kind, identities, digital identities, um, properties, land titles. We'll get a little bit more into some of the use cases, but it's important to, to think about the security features of blockchain. Why our information is being securely stored on that network and, and what that allows for us in terms of opportunities and resources. Cynthia, I know I've been speaking for a little while. Is there anything that you would like to add to any of that? Well, you really caught my attention when you made the reference to double spend. And this is kind of the magic sauce, ladies. So as, as Dr. Martin alluded, Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain was actually the first time several key technologies came together. And there had been previous digital currencies, um, uh, uh, Hashcash and a variety of others, where computer scientists were attempting to solve this issue. How can we create digital gold? Digicash digi digi was another one. And so, and there were computer scientists like David Chom, everybody was working on this. And whatever the entity, whoever Satoshi Nakamoto is, a man, a woman, a committee, a group of scientists, whoever authored the white paper, what they figured out is how to avoid double spend in the general ledger, the distributed ledger. And what double spend means is this, and just even knowing this little part about how Bitcoin or how the blockchain works, I think will advance advantage you. Um, when I send you an email, how many copies do we have? At least two, mine and the one I sent you. Well, that's a problem if you're dealing with currency. There can't be multiple copies. That's, that's the beauty of, of fiat. If I hand you a $100 bill and I walk away, you have my $100 bill and I don't have another one. Well, all the digital attempts to create currency ran into this problem. Two copies, multiple versions. 
But what blockchain solved in the Bitcoin protocol, the algorithm that cannot be changed, and we can explain why it cannot be changed later, because a lot of people say, can't you just change it? But the network does not allow that, which is now so distributed and so powerful, they will not be changing it. And so, and it's of course, as, as we've talked about, it's having every four years adding to its scarcity, which is why the gold reference is often there. So this double spend business is very important. Go look it up, type it into YouTube, and you'll see that it's the thing that was holding back digital currency, the problem that couldn't be solved. And there are other things you can look up like the Byzantine generals problem. There are mechanics that prevented this from happening until finally everything collided and the problem was solved. And that is done with cryptography public keys, private keys. When I send Dr. Martin some Satoshis, some pieces of my Bitcoin, they're gone. I can't get them back. I don't have my original copy. It's gone. And um, so, and in some ways, you know, you hear that this is why criminals use Bitcoin, you know, because it's, it's, um, it's a way to conduct transactions illegally. And because it was used with Silk Road, it's had this bad reputation of being connected to dark money. The truth is actually the opposite. There are more crimes committed with cash, which is completely untraceable, than there are with blockchain currencies, which are recorded permanently on the blockchain. They're anonymous, but they're pseudonymous. Those addresses are trackable. Just like if you do bad things on your computer, your IP address is trackable. They don't really need to know your name. They have your IP address. And that's why women like Katherine Hahn have educated the FBI in how to track crime easily using the blockchain. So I, I just wanted to point out the double spend is a very important thing. The other thing that I think you also talked touched on um, is this idea of where you get your information. And so one of the things that we wanted to share with you and make clear is if you are listening to the news, you do not know anything about what is actually going on. Remember what the goal of newsmakers is. It's to get eyeballs on pages. So on Monday, Bitcoin is going to the moon. And on Wednesday, Bitcoin is crashing, right? You're going to hear a whole bunch of this next week because on April 14th, Coinbase is going with a public IPO and you're going to hear all about everything crypto. And then they'll, they'll say, well, there's a crash coming or they'll document a crash and it has been volatile. And yet it's consolidating in a rhythmic pattern as would be predicted with every having. So do your research. Don't listen to the news. This is called FUD and FOMO. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Fear of missing out. And they play both because their numbers go up. Their advertising numbers go up. And most frequently, they're, they're not dealing with any kind of an in-depth understanding of the technology at hand. And, and Lena, I'll turn it back over to you, but I wanna say one last thing. The financial pipes that we are running money on are very broken. You cannot make a cross-border pay. How does Apple pay its employees all around the world? In a constellation of, of currencies? that are all pegged to the USD, that are all being printed every week, more dollars, more dollars, more dollars, because we've got problems, so let's print more money. Something's wrong with the system. And furthermore, all of the pipes it runs on were built in the 70s, which is why you buy something with your credit card on a Thursday and it doesn't show up until Monday. It's written in COBOL. These are archaic languages. And so all the new languages, Ethereum being written in Solidity, and all these newer computer languages provide us with um, options for new payment rails, where money is seen transparently and dynamically on the blockchain in instant real time. 
traded 24 seven, not like Wall Street, eight to five, then closing it down around the world. And Dr. Martin also used the word distributed quite a bit. There's three systems, centralized, distribute or centralized, decentralized, and distributed, where every node is connected to every node, creating a kind of a net. And it's an unhackable net because every computer has a permanent record of every transaction. You can't take them all down at once. It'd be like breaking into a house, but you have to break into the whole town. That's what it would take to hack it. You have to break into every house at once and that's not going to happen. So, um, and I don't know, Lena, if you wanna talk about the difference. One thing I know we wanted to cover was Ethereum and yeah. the differences yeah. in yeah. contracts. Sure, so real quick too, as Cynthia was saying about the nodes, think of them as computers and think of it as these are when you hear about miners or you hear about, these are people who have elected in to have their computers be part of this network. You don't have to do that. So don't worry about it. If you're interested, we could talk about, but that's not something you know necessarily for you. Um, the other thing that I appreciate what Cynthia was saying, think about it too as not only get find out who the sources are in terms of where the information is coming from, whether it's on the news, but also understand large companies. Large companies and leaders are coming out saying blockchain's not good or crypto's not good. You have to look at the source because again, certain banks might come out and say it because they don't want to become irrelevant in the space. So they might come up with ways of being, now there's benefits to, to having cash be electronic. It's not that, but the true spirit of crypto is about decentralization. So when you start looking at PayPal, for example, being able to offer crypto, Take a look at what does that mean? Does it mean I can connect my personal wallet to that crypto? Now they said they could because there's been some criticism because it really they owned your crypto if you bought it through PayPal. So again, you have to look at the source. And oftentimes while IBM is doing interesting things with supply chain and food called food trust, a lot of IBM and bigger companies, they're actually learning about blockchain through smaller companies. And I am proud to say that um, some of my team members at Blockchain at Pepperdine are, are founders of something called Blockchain Training Alliance. And you'll be hearing more about this, but they were just, it was announced this week and I'm very excited, were just scooped up by a public company. So they are doing some amazing things. However, it's some of the smaller companies and smaller um, uh, individuals, entrepreneurs that are really making waves in the blockchain space. And so I think companies and industries are just trying to catch up and find a place for themselves, which again, brings us to difference between what does Ethereum offer? Think of as when we talk about tokens, now blockchain has many use cases. One is money, one is smart contracts. We'll talk about that. And one is like the idea of tokens. So the idea of tokens, tokens can be security, equity, or utility. They can serve a function. And the Ethereum blockchain, while it has a token associated with it called Ether that can be exchanged with Bitcoin and, and other um, you know, cryptocurrencies, it's actually something that helps run the Ethereum blockchain. And what the Ethereum blockchain offers for businesses is the enterprise level or solution. So, you can use, I think this is a good learning point of blockchain can be an infrastructure. It can add security for one's data within a company. It has a lot of applicability there in terms of infrastructure and data security, integrity, things like that. And then you've got cryptocurrencies. So cryptocurrencies are only one use case under this huge umbrella of what blockchain software or otherwise known as distributed ledger technology offers. So I do want to maybe get into a little bit about smart contracts. What is a smart contract? Because I'm sure you've been hearing that word floating around. Smart contracts, they're not legal contracts. And as some say, they're not actually that smart. What, a, what they are is just a computer protocol intended to facilitate or verify or enforce a negotiation or a performance of a contract. So what is that? It's just a software mach or machine that's executing according to a contract, just an agreement between two people. It can offer 
payment systems. It can offer, um, you know, one example is in real estate, it can help with the escrow process because again, what smart contracts do is it eliminates any middlemen and those middlemen just take fees and take time. So it's streamlining processes. Another, I think, important use case, as you might have heard about with smart contracts, are NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So fungibility and non-fungibility. Fungible just refers to Bitcoin, for example, or dollar, things that can be exchanged with one another. I could have a crumpled up dollar over here and a crisp dollar over here, but it's still a dollar. But non-fungible or being non-fungibility is when things don't equal each other. So I could have a fresh apple over here and a rotten apple over here, but you're not going to trade me, uh, you know, for for that apple because it's not the same value. So NFTs, you've been hearing it all over. You've probably heard it more associated with art and collectibles right now. Um, as we said, Christie's just auctioned off 60 $69 million piece of artwork by someone named Beeple. Um, that was just some people are calling it a bubble in the space. We have yet to really know all the applications of NFTs. Only one is art and collectibles. Um, Michael Quigley, for those who are, know the space, um, very, very, uh, you know, advocate of and, and entrepreneur and advisor in the space, um, he has said that anything that is not able to be eaten will be an NFT. <laughs> That's important to know because that can mean documents, records, land titles. It could be um, art. It could be collectibles. It can also be a use case of music royalties um, or any kind of royalty because, again, you've got this contract that now in terms of art and collectibles, you, you authenticate that that's what it is and it becomes rare and, and scarce and it can't be you know equated to something else. So that's where it, get, it gets its values. But it can also be documents and, and things like, okay, if this piece of music is being played somewhere in the world, I'm gonna build in a fee so that the original artist or the original creator actually gets paid for their work. So we're empowering artists and creators at the same time, right? I just want to run through some real quick other use cases because we mentioned it in our intro when we invited you here. So healthcare and for COVID especially, blockchain, again, blockchain as an infrastructure, as a way to think of it like a database, a way to securely store, but it's a shared database across all those nodes and computers around the world, but it's a way to secure information, uh, a way to offer integrity of data. So it's simplifying clinical trial processes for vaccines and drugs. It's a reliable data tracker. It's tracking donations and fundraising activities. That's an important one for philanthropies. Remember, like if, if I want to make sure my money is going to where I donate it, we can actually track it on a blockchain and make sure it's going to where we say it's going. It's also for COVID um, and healthcare, assisting in early detection of outbreaks, fast tracking drug delivery, think about supply chains. You know, if um, something goes wrong, it can take weeks to find out where in that supply chain something went wrong. If you track it on the blockchain, also using AI and some other emerging technologies, you can know in three seconds where that fault point was. Um, it's also helping with providing user privacy protection during treatment. So again, securing um, digital identities and information, uh, allowing only permissioned users to see that information. It's enabling accurate and, and trustworthy data, things like that. Again, though, it's important to remember, it's coming back to the values of decentralization, transparency, in some cases, you, you can have a public open blockchain like Bitcoin, but then you can have others for enterprises where it's permissioned access to the data. But it's also immutable. You can't change the data. It's, 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 you will always have that history. Um, think about it as it tells the story of the data, which is so important. Global poverty, real quick. Protection of land rights. This is important because again, land and property titles can be stored on the blockchain. And this is preventing fraud, corruption, forgery because protection of land rights can really help um, in terms of global poverty. The other thing that can help, inclusive economies. So again, more than a world, or more than a quarter, and I've heard um, a third of the world is unbanked. So usually uh, this is due to limited proof of identification or credit history, but cryptocurrencies 
as well as blockchain as you know an infrastructure for digital identities are providing economic freedom around the world, especially for women and micro entrepreneurs. But cryptocurrencies and digital identities, they're providing more accessibility. They're providing faster ways of, let's say, sending money to family across the world. It's cheaper, easier finances. Um, so, and, and I wish we had time to go into all the myths about blockchain. Um, yes, there's, there's fees now, but it's cheaper than other fees, that sort of thing. So again, that's why we really wanna encourage you to be sure to do your research. Also real quick, I wanna talk about human trafficking because this is a great use case as well. So I know there's a lot of reasons for this, but just for time, <laughs> for the purposes of time, a lot of uh, victims have few resources and, and lack identification. That's one big thing about um, you know, human trafficking. So imagine if there was the ability um, to store someone's virtual identity, and we can secure this by biometrics, whether it's a fingerprint, whether it's an eye scan, but we can create digital identity that, it, that people don't have to have IDs or carry IDs. This is also finding a lot of use cases for the, for the homeless and getting housing for the homeless. But imagine if we could secure that and create that, that digital identity. Well, what does that do for human trafficking? It, it makes it very difficult for human traffickers to take victims across country borders, let's say, because we can quickly find out who is this person, right? So there's just, and, and that digital identity portion can be applicable to a lot of different industries. Again, once you know the use cases of blockchain and cryptocurrencies like smart contracts, like money, like um, a digital ledger, uh, all these digital assets, all these different use cases, you can take it across various industries, all industries. There's a lot it's doing in education, like credentialing, knowing someone's, they're calling a lifelong learning password actually, but you can track along your whole journey of education and be able to verify to future employees or to future universities you apply to that yes, this person did get these credits and yes, they are from a, an authoritative source and yes, and, and maybe permission it out for those people to see. There's things like um, intellectual property so that you can expose all of your great ideas, but never worry about those ideas not being given back to the original creator. Um, those are the kinds of things that it's doing. I know that uh, we're running out of time, but real estate is another big one. And we talked a little bit about it, but it's having so much um, applications in like land titles, but also data collection, um, data integrity. It's also allowing for more investors to, and again, this is where it's, it's really opening up economic inclusion is that anyone could maybe get in on tokenizing of property so that people can, um, you know, be part of certain investing opportunities and things because we're tokenizing ownership. Fractional ownership is also what it's known as. Um, again, we're going through this very quickly, but I did just want to get through some of those highlights that we've talked about. Um, Cynthia, anything you want to add there? Well, I do think we can move over to the question and answer portion of our event, but I wanted to give you a list of, a, a quick, very cursory list of women who are leading the field um, so that you have just some names because you can easily Google all of this and see what women are doing to take charge of this industry. So Laura Shin, uh, Forbes, uh, former Forbes journalist who authored the FinTech 50, she abandoned ship when she realized the magnitude of what was about to happen at hand with the Bitcoin protocol. She's been covering it ever since. She's interviewed everyone. She does not miss a beat. You can find all her work online, Unchained, um, the Unchained podcast. And what she'll do, for example, Linda mentioned that this NFT by Beeple sold last week for $69 million. She'll interview the author of the artwork and then she'll interview Metacoven, the person who bought it and why. And is it a bubble and why did he spend this? It's a beautiful uh, marriage of true journalism where all things are covered. Another person I made reference is Katie Hahn. Look up Caitlin Long. She's the, Wash the Wyoming Senator who um, is also the CEO and president of Avanti Bank. She was Wall Street for 22 years and she's rapidly moving Wyoming into being a crypto leader. This is also happening in Florida, which is the mayor is making a crypto hub there so that um, people can easily get paid in crypto and et cetera. Uh, Professor Tanya M. Evans, 
She is a mind-blowing Harvard lawyer who is now a, a full professor at Penn State Dickinson Law. Incredible woman of color, absolutely leading the charge. Um, Elizabeth Stark, the co-author of the Lightning Network. These are the second layer protocols. You've heard maybe that Bitcoin has some problems, like it's slow, like a block is only mined every 10 minutes. Lightning Network solves that. They're creating workaround pipes. Remember, this is open source technology. It's very different than a company like Apple with their private world of what they're creating. It's open source technology. That's why the adoption curve is happening so rapidly. You can look right on the GitHub repository and see everything happening in real time as these systems are being built to overcome some of the obstacles, faster throughput time, fast. So, those are just some of the women. Um, I hope I haven't, Mel oh my gosh, Meltem Demiros. You, this, these people will blow your mind how smart these women are. She's the chief strategy officer at CoinShares, former director of development for digital consulting, M digital consulting, MBA from MIT. She's a Harvard and Oxford lecturer. You will love listening to these women as they pioneer something that is the wild west. There's nobody who's set up full shop yet. So um, I wanted to get that in before the questions and then we'll turn it over. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Yeah, Martin. just real quick. So I did talk about uh, Blockchain Revolution by Don and Alex Capscott. The other one that I would encourage anyone who's interested, crypto asset investing in the age of autonomy. This just came out by Jake Ryan. We will put it in the chat, um, came out in December. Full disclosure, I am on the back endorsing it but I am not getting any awards or, or money or anything. I just love this, this author and this book. And if you're starting out, this is a great place to start out because there's, there's information about the history of blockchain in it and then just goes into cryptocurrencies. But it's a great place to start. Real quick, um, getting started, uh, research the use cases. Go on to your favorite search engine. Doesn't have to be Google. There's one called Brave. Check out Brave. You can actually earn and you don't get advertisements because again, it's all about advertisements coming at you. You don't need to give away your data. You don't need to be targeted. Check out Brave. But anyway, research blockchain four and whatever you're interested in. Blockchain four global poverty, blockchain for industry and finance or whatever it is, you will find the some interesting information. Also checking out crypto books, articles, podcasts, as Cynthia was saying, important, explore um, blockchain crypto virtual events. There's a lot of communities. We want to create a community for you too, if you're interested. So we'll talk about that. And then for more support, obviously contact us. Also real quick, if you are interested in getting involved in crypto, but you don't want to be personally or directly involved, there are other ways. So those ways include um, investing companies that hold Bitcoin or other cryptos, things like MicroStrategy, Tesla, again, not financial advice, but you can look into it. Look at companies with technology related to Bitcoin or blockchain, like IBM or Microsoft, you know, you can do the research or check out a cryptocurrency fund. Um, there's also crypto IRAs. So you can actually roll over some money into to crypto funds as well. So again, talk to your advisors on that. Um, but if investing directly, learn, learn, learn as much as possible. Only invest what you're willing to lose. Um, there are certain stats, some say one to 5% of your liquidity, but only what you're investing to lose or, or you know, able to lose um, at first and then hold for the long term. And if you hold for the long term, you do it on a hardware wallet, hardware storage, we call it cold storage, and you buy it directly from the manufacturer. You won't always see this, but you do not buy it on Amazon because they can hack in. Again, it's not crypto and Bitcoin that is vulnerable. It is sometimes the surrounding exchanges or third parties that are helping it um, you know, manage it for you. So you want to make sure that it's like going in a parking lot. You'd never pick up a USB and put it in your computer because it could have malware on it. It's the same thing by directly from the manufacturer. And some people say they like hold it in their, you know, um, bank uh, vault box, but others say don't do that because bank shut down, you don't get access. So again, you could get into this whole world and we could talk about it. But the other thing, if you are interested in investing, there's a lot of information online about that, but Start with a Coinbase account. 
this is your wallet. There's lots of information online or we can help you about how to do that. That's the most simple way of going about it. Then you're going to buy Bitcoin and then you're going to decide, am I going to buy, sell or trade? If trading, you're going to go to one called Binance. There's many out there, but that's the most simple. And then you decide, okay, so for those sophisticated, there's bot traders. That's basically just automated traders or you trade yourself. It takes a lot of time. It does. So some people just want to buy some Bitcoin and just hold it, see what happens, learn as you go. Um, but happy to talk to those who want to get more involved because there's a lot of interesting opportunities out there called DeFi, which is decentralized financing and ways to earn on the money that or on the crypto that you buy. So called staking but again there's there's a lot of information out there um don't worry if you're not getting it all right now because all of this the dots connect as you learn more and more and it's important to learn but um and okay so i think we're good for questions <laughs> there's so much cynthia and i could talk about we get so excited wonderful thank you dr martin and take a deep breath i am i am out of breath just listening to both of you and i love your passion that's coming through because you have spent the time to really dissect this and understand this and live this and work with this so i am taking that point and extending that to all of these ladies that there is so much more that we personally ourselves need to dig into um, if we're going to enter this forum but thank you so much for for all of that information, I want to let you ladies know that this session is being recorded. It will be on our website and I will send all of the links to the books and the ladies that have been highlighted by Cynthia in the chat again to you via email. So you can take the time to, to read more about them and learn more about them. Um, we don't have much time left here today. I did want to get to one of the questions that was posed in the chat first, um, and that is the, the idea of cryptocurrency and how Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. So I think there's a little confusion in some of our guests of, can you delineate the difference between crypto and Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera? So I saw that question and here's a couple of things to learn. B with a capital Bitcoin is basically the network. B with a lowercase Bitcoin is basically the currency. And we never say Bitcoins, we just say Bitcoin. And um, the, the, the notion is that Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, but not all cryptocurrencies are Bitcoin. So there are others. There are forks of Bitcoin. There's wrapped Bitcoin. There's light Bitcoin. There's Litecoin. There's Bitcoin Cash. There are hard forks and soft forks. And then, like Dr. Martin said, there are all alternative cryptocurrencies that were never meant to act as money. What is money other than a social construct? It's a medium of exchange, right? It's a unit of account, right? We can identify some things about money. It's a store of value which is why Bitcoin is often called digital gold. Ether, also a cryptocurrency, is none of that. It's smart contracts, autonomously executed. The fees are the gas fees of Ether. So they're very different. It's kind of like saying pineapples and strawberries are both fruits. Extremely different. And uh, something that my, uh, one of my family members taught me is that Bitcoin is master of its own domain. Ethereum is no challenge to it in the sense that Bitcoin is a shark, but Ethereum is a lion, master of its own domain, smart contracts in a whole different way. And so, and as Dr. Martin said, there are now thousands of altcoins. Um, and what they are is, this is one thing I did get out of my credentialing process is what they are is they are variety. They do variety of things that tokens can do. Some are utility tokens, some are governance tokens. Some are, they, they all have a little bit of a different function. And the way you can think about that is one of the analogies of when we've talked about this is it's like knowing about water. What is water? Well, it's H2O. Well, that's the code. That's the molecular structure. What we have to talk about is what does it do and how can it be used? Oh, well, it can help a boat get down a river. 
or it can be frozen and then turned into steam and create power or so the used cases of these alt coins um, are just so far flung you can't imagine in fact i i was in thinking about a new alt coin that is distributed vpn now that's a good idea right and so but you have to check into it on your own you're going to hear ethereum's wonderful here comes cardano the ethereum killer and you have to figure out you have to educate yourself what am i really learning here and that's why one of the things dr martin and i wanted to do is just to give you some basic fundamental language and and contacts if i was going to recommend a book i would recommend the sovereign individual what would happen if money was not mixed up with government the same way we have a barrier between church and state because we don't want the government defining our religion what would happen if the government was not in control of our money and make no mistake you are not in control of your money and if you have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank and you go right down to bank of america to get it out you know what they're going to tell you we don't have that much here it's all just a ledger this is fractional reserve banking they've only got a piece of what is yours the rest is debt it's out it's being loaned out so pay attention to money yeah i'll, I'll drive home just one more point think of blockchain as or I'll reiterate blockchain as the software blockchain is the umbrella right it's it's what so all crypto involves blockchain but not all blockchain have to, to involve crypto so and under this blockchain umbrella there's one use case of cryptocurrencies and within cryptocurrencies is bitcoin but there's also these other tokens that serve more functions or utilities like uh, Wozniak just came out with one um, uh, on, on energy. And so, but it's serving a function. It can still be traded for Bitcoin, but Bitcoin serving more as like money. It's more equated to money, even though people are more holding it for value, but it's more money thinking about it. And then these other tokens are more serving functions, but can still be traded with Bitcoin. And then you've got all the other things under blockchain software, like smart contracts or NFTs, or like these digital identities we can set up that are also being run by tokens. But again, they're serving more business use cases. And so what's being used for there right now is mostly the Ethereum blockchain. There's different blockchains, different uses. I know it's a lot, but there, but Bitcoin just happened to be the first use of the blockchain software. And now we've come up with all these other ways and we're still discovering ways. That's the exciting. The thing I get a lot of enjoyment out of is creating these, these new um, solutions that blockchain and crypto can offer for businesses. Things like setting up incentivization um, so people can actually earn by participating in an ecosystem or network on a business. Um, so for example, if I wanted to donate to um, philanthropies, I can earn bonus points that could eventually equate to more money I can donate to other philanthropies. You know, you could just get really creative, um, but there's certainly a difference. Uh, but in terms of, you know, it's more entrepreneurs and businesses that are using these functional tokens, but anybody can get involved and companies are even investing in the money side or the Bitcoin side. And I would add the way I think of Bitcoin is it's the bellwether. The current system is not working well and it's broken and there's a better alternative right on the horizon and it's the network effects that drive one person telling another person and then another person and then another person and um, it's it would be very hard to stop the growth that it's experienced now you know they keep calling it a bubble but it's actually consolidating and consolidating and consolidating and growing increasingly scarcer with every four years. Thank you. I know we are at our time. So for those of you that do need to leave us, we thank you for joining us today. But there are two other questions that are in the chat that if you all 
are interested in staying and listening to that, we welcome you. Um, this one was elevated by a couple of our members um, after Dr. Martin had talked about where to buy your currency and, and reference not doing so on Amazon, et cetera. So the question is, is Robinhood vulnerable as well, um, since that is where this individual is, is has received some of their, their coins. Sure, and, and just to clarify, it, don't buy your cold storage, your hardware wallets on Amazon. Um, now, that's because it could have been manipulated or you, know, you don't wanna get hacked. Um, but in terms of where to buy your Bitcoin, I, again, I would suggest starting with, with Coinbase, um, and then, but you need to, to learn all the different, some people do it through PayPal, but again, they only recently have been talking about being able to access it. The thing is in certain wallets, you don't really own, you don't have the keys to it, even though you can use the crypto there, you want to kind of have ownership over your crypto. Um, and in terms of Robinhood, that was an interesting um, incident that happened not too long ago that I want to speak to with, with what happened with GameStop. And I'm sure you, you've heard about it. But what was interesting about this, if you notice, was that on those mainstream media channels, they actually were starting to bring in crypto experts. That is a big deal because now in order to wrap their minds for people to wrap their minds about what is going on here they started bringing in crypto experts that's huge for the industry and the adoption curve so again i would encourage you no matter what wallet you start that you do the research and read the fine print in terms of now Certain wallets, because you're not managing the keys, it's easier to get started. Maybe PayPal or something like that is easier to get started and learn and understand. But if you want to own and have ownership over your own crypto, start with Coinbase. But it, it's very easy if you just start searching, how do I start a Coinbase account? How do I buy Bitcoin? But do the research. It lays it all out on, online. And Elena and I talked about this quite a bit because Coinbase is your most secure option. It's the most mainstream. It's the safest for you, especially if you don't know what you're doing. That being said, the flip side of that it is, is, is it is just like a bank. It is a centralized repository with your private keys on it. They are custodying your coins. And there's a famous phrase in crypto land, not your keys, not your coins. So if they were to get hacked, your coins are at risk. So there's upsides and downsides. And um, you're going to hear a lot about this in the media when they go public in a week. And I'm so glad you're going to be able to say something fancy at a party like, yeah, well, that's a centralized repository. So, um, so they are trustworthy. And yet, if you know much about the, the, some of the fundamentals that we've talked about, Bitcoin cannot be centralized. And the only way it can be hacked is if, like Lena said, you're storing it in a wallet that is attached to the internet, hot storage instead of cold storage, that's hackable, or in an exchange like Coinbase or Kraken or Gemini or any of those. And don't say it can't happen. It happened to the Dow in 2013 and people lost millions of dollars. The most secure thing you can do if you plan on, look, I just want to buy a little now and then do my research, get a cold storage or a hardware wallet, um, do the research too, or just store it. If it's not much, just keep it on Coinbase till you learn more. But if you're going to hold for long term, you want to get it into a, a hardware wallet that you buy directly from the and manufacturer. Then wanna, and then you want to not you, not lose your ledger wallet and have your keys written down somewhere. You hear the stories of people that lost their passwords and they don't know where their private keys are. And that's a problem. And it's something that scares people enough to choose Coinbase and let's, yeah. let them be responsible for it. And I promise you, again, this is a lot of information, but as soon as you start doing the research yourself, it all connects. Don't get discouraged <laughs> and it's never too late. Don't think, oh, I missed the bo boat. No, it's going to continue to rise. And, and, and as Cynthia was saying, just make sure you're doing all the steps 
it says to do save your you know your your seed phrase save your passwords all of that but just take your time enjoy the journey it's exciting when you start thinking about the possibilities of blockchain for crypto as well as business solutions industry solutions it's an exciting time there is a shift and this is why we can bring more social and economic inclusion to the world and for individuals Good word. Thank you for reframing that because yes, it can seem like a chore as opposed to an opportunity uh, sometimes. So zooming back out in this, uh, the notion of blockchain, and you've talked about how um, it can aid in, in poverty and the idea of digital identity. Um, can you explain how those without internet access can utilize blockchain and also maybe some of the vulnerabilities of blockchain? Sure, sure. So, so one thing I'll, I'll give you an example of a project I was working on called supply change spelled uh, C H A I N G E playoff blockchain. Um, and what it was was the ability to tip our essential workers so small farmers, for example. So if I went to the grocery store and I see this amazing, you know, produce and I'm thinking, oh, I really want to tip the farmers, I can scan a QR code on my phone. I've already set up a back end wallet, let's say, and I scan the QR code and I'm able to securely tip my farmer. Maybe I want to give a dollar, maybe I want to give whatever. And so um, that is then through the application stored and be able to sent, be sent directly to the farmers. But let's say the farmers don't have internet access. And amazingly around the world, this is a true fact, amazingly where we think some of the poorest places in the world are, they still have phones. So all you need is a phone. You don't have to have internet because there's something called the mesh network, M-E-S-H. Look it up, it's fascinating. But it's the ability that all you need is connectivity. You don't necessarily need the internet. And, and again, blockchain doesn't require the internet. So it's an amazing ability to connect more people around the world. And again, be able to share or donate resources. There's the opportunity. So that's just one use case. Um, vulnerabilities, that's an interesting one. So I can talk to challenges. We've been told, we've, we've talked about how um, you know, some people say uh, it's draining a lot. So vulnerabilities are not necessarily there unless the unless there's third party involvement. The technology itself is very sound. Um, some people start getting into quantum computing um, as, as a potential uh, threat. However, that'd be like shooting yourself in your own foot. We could talk about it, but actually blockchain can make quantum computing more secure. So that's a whole other interesting conversation. The vulnerabilities aren't as much as, let's call them like adoption challenges. So the energy usage, that's that's been sort of a, a topic of conversation for a long time. Basically with that, so, most mining companies, there was a lot of usage of energy in the beginning, you know, environmental concerns. However, it wasn't as much usage as is being used for traditional banking systems or mining gold. So if you think about it that way, the other thing is that um, a lot of mining companies are using alternative resources. So that's, that's uplifting, um, as well as it can actually blockchain that underlying software can actually um, help with a lot of environmental causes. So maybe like we kind of weigh, balance out the uh, the risks there, but it can actually offer more protection through um, through for processes through transparency, which aids in sustainability. So again, this is why it's important that when you start hearing myths out there like oh it's you know can't be scaled. Well, it, here's the thing. There's level two like solutions, which means there's the solutions as we know it. And now people are putting a top layer on top of that so that there's more user ability, more um, user experience, friendliness, more, you know, th there's just, um, or Ethereum is soon coming out with Ethereum 2.0, which is less usage fees, um, gas fees than, than what we're currently used to. So a lot of the things that you think was a problem last week, you look it up this week and there's some kind of solution out there. It moves that quickly. That's why it's so exciting. So again, questions, 
the sources, do your own research, make up your own mind, um, use critical thinking, you know, approaches to everything that you're learning. Um, and, and it's a fascinating rabbit hole, I guarantee. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you both uh, for being with us today. So much information. We could have many lifelong learning sessions on just these topics alone. So ladies, if you would join me in thanking both of our presenters, Dr. Martin and Cynthia Ware for your time and your expertise from Kathy Don Hockle and Dean Helen Williams. Ladies, thank you so much for such a wonderful season. Thank you for bearing with us through a pandemic and joining virtually. Blessings to you all. Thank you so much and go do your research and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you.